What's up guys, Alexander here. A lot of you have asked how the COVID-19 pandemic may have affected dating, specifically in relationship to online dating. I recently ran the GSS statistics for 2021 and some people wondered from that as well how that may have carried over, how it may have changed patterns of dating app use and patterns of relationships, patterns of sexual behavior as well. So I wanted to share a new study with you today. This is the first study following the COVID pandemic in relationship to relationships specifically and specifically how the pandemic has affected relationships between 2020 and today. We're going to cover four main topics in this general mental health that can indirectly impact relationships. We're going to cover how sexual behavior has changed during the pandemic. We're going to cover how the pandemic has affected dating app use specifically and also how the pandemic has affected general relationship patterns. So first, let's get into some of the changes in sexual behavior that we have seen throughout the pandemic. Uh, indirectly first, to cover something, one of the best, uh, or I should say, one of the strongest effects that has come from the pandemic is economic stress. And this could be put into the, the indirect effects section as well, but I wanted to go ahead and mention it firstly, because economic stress has strong effects on sexual behavior and on relationship outcomes. It's one of the strongest predictors of divorce, and it's also a very strong predictor of acute sexual dysfunction as well. For example, erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, low sexual desire, low desire for intimacy with your partner. These are all things that are indirectly impacted by economic stresses, and these are things that we see throughout the COVID pandemic in relation to sexual behavior that is probably affected in part by economic factors. Uh, there was a small meta-analysis done by Masudo and colleagues, if I'm saying that right, and this indicated actually that women have reported a greater decline in sexual desire over the pandemic than men. Although both men and women have reported a decline, a lowering of sexual desire during the pandemic, throughout the quarantines and so on. If you remember, if you have read uh, the GSS 2021 data that I ran, uh, women in 2021 reported, more women I should say, reported having no sexual partners than men, which was a big change, for example, from the 2018 GSS data, which became very popular, it kind of became viral, showing that male virginity or men not having sex over that year increased a great deal. Last year, in 2021, we saw a reversal, not a reversal of that effect, but I should say a catching up of women, where women, and, and a surpassing, where women actually reported having less sex than men. So this meta-analysis would be consistent with that, at least partially, in that it indicated that women had a greater lowering of sexual desire than men did. And biologically, there are probably explanations for this as well. For example, we know that the effects of stress from the pandemic cause a general increase in cortisol, and that has an effect on women much more strongly, specifically the relationship of stress and cortisol, or I should say stress mediated by, mediated by cortisol, and how that affects sexual desire. It lowers sexual desire in women much, much more than it does in men. <laughs> Something else that we have seen that is related to this trend and kind of confirms it indirectly is we actually see much more solo sexual behavior. And what does that mean? Basically, masturbation for men and women. More men and women are reporting more use of uh, pornography and more use of, of solo sexual stimulation, masturbation. Now, on the flip side of this, one cohort, which was married people, actually reported having more sex. Boyfriends and girlfriends didn't, unless they were cohabitating. And so, what we're looking at here is people living together, boyfriends and girlfriends, and married people having more sex on average throughout the COVID pandemic. This was something observed kind of early on, and people had predicted that there would be like a COVID baby boom. I'm not sure that a COVID baby boom has actually materialized. I don't know for sure if the data supports that, and in this review that we're looking at, they didn't know either. Additionally, I don't know if it's because the research hasn't been done or because they didn't find an effect, but they did mention that there wasn't a greater prediction or an indication to have children. So for example, being locked down under quarantine during the pandemic, it didn't heighten the desire to have kids either. So if this, this increase in sex has led to more children is uncertain at the moment, but that may be explained by something which we'll look at in a minute also, which has to do with the effect sizes here. 
So as I mentioned, boyfriends and girlfriends not living together reported having less sex. This is reported in a study by Kuhn and colleagues, which you can look at in the original study. I would recommend reading the original study, actually, and going through and finding the original study that's reporting, because this is a, a literature review of all of the studies during this time. So if you want to look at the specific details, which I'll actually go into with this one study, uh, I would recommend going back and finding the ones that interest you and reading it. So we see boyfriends and girlfriends actually had less sex during the pandemic, and both men and women reported a lower participation in, in casual sex or hookups. Now this is where I'd like to look at the, the Coombe and colleagues study in a little bit more detail because something I've said on this channel before and I'll probably continue saying into the future, if you see a study, you read a study online, you hear it on YouTube like right now and someone says, ah, they're having less sex and they're having more sex, that doesn't actually tell you as much as it sounds. You may get the impression that it's a large difference or a meaningful difference, it really may not be. And so it's really important with all of these studies, and you'll unfortunately, in the media and stuff, you'll see, you'll see it reported just like that, and that's actually how it was reported in this literature review as well. Just they're having more sex, they're having less sex. But is it is it 50% more? Is it 1% more? Because that's a big difference. It's a big difference if it's actually a meaningful decline or not. So I went back, I looked at the, the sizes of the effects in this original study being referenced in the literature review. And what we're seeing is that the married sex that increased, the cohabiting sex between boyfriends and girlfriends as well, this was an increase of about 6%. So is that a large increase? I mean, intuitively, from the way we think about numbers, probably not. 6% over a entire population, however, is fairly large. Uh, it's large enough where you could see things like an increase in the birth rate. You, you can see large changes at, in large populations, even when there is a very small effect size. On an individual level, is that going to be a lot? Probably not. Boyfriends and girlfriends, I mentioned that they had less sex uh, if not living together. So basically, boyfriends and girlfriends who don't live together. The decline here was only 3%. So again, we're seeing a very, very small effect. So is it really impacting the sex lives of, of couples, the pandemic, that much? Even not living together in quarantine? Probably not. They're probably still mostly meeting up and having sex. Even though there's a decline, it's a very, very small decline, a decline of 3% from before the pandemic. Where we really see the big decline is in the casual sex and hookups. 31% of people before the pandemic reported engaging in casual sex and hookups. In the during and post pandemic period, this dropped down to 8%. So this is actually a fairly large effect. The pandemic seems to have really impacted hookups and casual sex more than other sexual relationships or or dynamics or whatever you would like to call it. If you have read the GSS 21 data that I ran, the article that I have on my website and referenced previously, most sex is already occurring in the context of relationships. So this is already a relatively small, smaller than most people think, percent of people that are actually having much casual sex or having casual sex at all for that matter. It's, it's gonna be about between 15 and 5% of the population only typically reporting that. So within that small percentage, the 31% that reported it dropped down to 8%. So we're seeing an effect of the pandemic. Probably more than anything, people don't want to meet strangers and potentially get sick. To me, I think that would be probably the best exp explanation for why. You have lockdowns, so people can't go out into social environments as well. Places where people normally are having hookups. Because as we'll see from the next section that we're going to look at, dating app use, dating app use actually increased, yet casual hookups and sex decreased. So most people, which has been the case before and during the pandemic, and at this moment I suppose now that things have been lifted, they're meeting people in person still to form their relationships and have casual hookups and so on. So even though we see that app use to meet people, dating app use, Tinder and stuff like that, increased a fairly substantial amount during the pandemic. Casual sex decreased nonetheless. Probably people aren't going out to clubs, they're not drinking, they're not getting drunk and having really casual hookups, which actually explains a lot of that, that very risky sexual behavior. And with that, we can go on to the next section, which is dating app use, okay? So dating app use, there was actually mixed results on this. 
Some of the data reported a decline, but I think most of the data, what we're looking at, especially data for specific apps like Tinder and Bumble, showed an increase. And of course, Tinder itself makes up, I believe, over half of online dating use. So if we see a major increase in that, which we did, it's going to indicate more people using these apps during the quarantine. Of course, this is kind of intuitive because if people can't go out to bars, they can't meet people in environments they normally would, they're at home, they're lonely, they got cabin fever, they're going to download these apps if they otherwise might not have just to talk and chat with people even if they don't want to meet people, which is also something that, that we'll cover a little bit more, that tendency for people, especially women, to get on these apps because they want to talk, they want to make an emotional connection, but they actually report having no intention to meet a person in real life. So with specific apps, we see, for example, Bumble reported an increase in users in that first six months of the pandemic by about 70%, and Tinder a whopping 700%, or a seven-fold increase in Tinder users following these, these quarantines and these lockdowns in the pandemic. But when we look at specific dating behavior and reports of people using the apps, we see that more people reported using these dates to chat more people reported using these dates to set up like virtual dates where they don't actually meet the person in person. And this is actually consistent kind of what I had just mentioned a moment ago with what we have seen, for example, in 2016 studies of Tinder, which I'll try to find again and put a link up here, which was about one third of women report using the apps just to chat without having an intention to meet anyone. And that has increased. And I think that probably explains in part why the apps are so frustrating, especially for men, because not only are there more men, not only are the most attractive men the ones who are selected in an even more consistent way than in real life, but inflating that, that, that ratio further, making that disparity larger, is the fact that a lot of women on there don't have any intention to meet anybody at all. And I can insert some dating advice that I tell young men often with these apps, uh, related to that and kind of based on that maybe some evidence-based dating advice here is that don't talk to people a long time on these apps guys don't chat with a woman for like weeks on these apps before meeting them you should have a date set up by the next day next two days maximum talk to her a little bit so she knows you're not like a crazy person you know that's gonna steal her kidney set up a meeting and if she doesn't want to you, you I would just rule it out and just move on to the next match and just think this is not a serious person they're not really interested in meeting someone in real life. They don't want a hookup or whatever. They don't want to date or meet a real person or have a relationship. Good chance they're just there to talk and they're getting from you what they want. And if you want more, uh, you're probably uh, going to be disappointed down the line, guys. So don't talk for a long time on these apps is my advice to you. <clears throat> now, this paper, the thesis was about how the pandemic affected dating app use, right? But they did, they did kind of a digression, and they reported a lot of statistics related to dating app use that was not related to the pandemic, but just to use in general, I think maybe to pad out the paper and make it larger, because it's already a pretty short short paper. But okay, so I'll do the same digression. I wanted to share this, this dating app information with you guys, because I think it's something that a lot of you will be interested in, even if it's general dating app use that existed before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and currently as well. So basically just a list of findings from recent dating app studies, but one of those is that people that use these apps consistently, especially consistently for about a year, they have higher levels of anxiety and depression. Now this again, like I said, you gotta, when someone says higher or lower, you gotta ask how much. The small effect size guys, like 0.10 or something. So you wouldn't know meeting a person if they use dating apps, if they're gonna be more likely to be depressed or not. This is, this is a small effect, but in populations, again, even small effects can be meaningful. And this is about the same effect size that we see with social media use. People who are consistently on social media also score higher in anxiety and depression, but the effect is not, it's not large, guys. It's a small effect size. We see some research related to attractiveness, basically that individuals who are lower in attractiveness are more likely to lie on their profiles, more likely to put up manipulated images, more likely to catfish. That's probably kind of a, uh, an intuitive one. There was some research done recently on perceptions of dating app use and risk. For example, they conducted a study where they had people rate the probability that their matches on a dating app had an STI or an STD. And what they found was that even, even when they asked these people, these individuals who admitted if they had an STD or an STI, people could not predict beyond chance who had an STD or an STI, which maybe also is kind of intuitive, guys, that you're not going to know who has a disease just by looking at their picture. But people thought they did, and actually people rated more attractive people as being more likely to have 
an STD or an STI, which I think is going to be kind of uh, intuitive as well because people are going to assume, ah, they're more attractive, they're probably more promiscuous, they're probably going to have more sex, and so they're going to be more likely to have uh, an STD or an STI. But that doesn't mean that there's no difference insofar as risky behavior on apps or associated with app use. A separate study found, for example, that people on dating apps were about twice as likely to report having risky sex or unprotected sex. So people using these apps, probably higher in social sexuality, probably more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior, specifically unprotected sex. This effect existed even when they controlled for impulsivity and demographics. What they did find, however, was that people on apps didn't report having more short-term partners over a short-term period. So we're not actually seeing people using apps being more promiscuous, although they are behaving in a more risky way. These are people that are probably more likely to have sex earlier with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, have unprotected sex, but not more likely to have multiple sexual partners, not more likely to be more promiscuous, probably still forming the same kind of socially monogamous relationship patterns, although maybe doing so in a more risky way, more earlier with more intimate, unprotected sexual contact early in the relationship. And a final finding, a lot of people, mostly women guys, report harassment on these apps. They report being contacted off of the app. Over 50% of women actually report being contacted off the app after they tell someone not to contact them anymore. So they're kind of risky as far as harassment. And there's been a lot of new research uh, related to that that a lot of people report getting sent. Uh, it was something like 60% reported getting sent unwanted sexual pictures, sexually explicit images. And I mean, we're talking about dick pics, guys. Guys sending pictures of their penises to women. So apparently this is pretty common on the apps as well, but something to consider if you're one of the women watching this. Okay, so let's put the dating app stuff to the side for a minute. Let's look more at uh, actual relationship behavior and how that may have been affected during the pandemic. So, as I mentioned, we saw increased dating app use, but we actually saw fewer meetings in person from these apps. We saw people basically chatting a really long time on these apps, kind of what was mentioned before having longer conversations as well. People report having longer conversations, chatting longer, trying to get, get to know people for longer periods of time before agreeing to actually meet them in public, which I think is probably another factor that may have made dating apps even more difficult or worse to use in some ways than before the pandemic. Uh, we see people confessing their romantic intentions on these apps uh, much earlier than they would have normally and in a way that they probably would not have done uh, outside of the pandemic, which is basically people building relationships online, falling in love with people online through these apps, telling these people that they have romantic feelings and that they love them. And all of this is happening before people even meet. So we're seeing essentially that these online relationships with real people met on dating apps during the pandemic were kind of developing as if they were relationships that people had met in person. Imagine, imagine talking to someone online so long that you're confessing romantic feelings for them instead of meeting them when they're in your city and you could actually go and meet them. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, maybe you would have done that. But because of the lockdowns or because you're afraid of the virus or whatever it may be, that's not what's happening. There's a concept here related to this behavior. And I, I suppose derived from this behavior, a concept in psychology that's called misattribution of arousal. And some of you guys may have experienced this. And so I'll explain it to you that way first. Uh, have you ever talked to someone online and you build an emotional connection with them or you talk to them on the phone and you think, oh, I really like this person. We have such a good spark. There's a good connection. And you meet them in person and it's like, oh, actually, I'm not attracted to this person at all. That's mis misattribution of arousal, guys. So people are building these relationships online. They're getting attracted to people online, but only through text, maybe through phones or through even through video chats. And then they meet in person and they think, ah, you know what? I'm not that attracted to this person because there's a that goes into attractiveness and attraction that you can't get from a picture, that you can't get from a text interaction or even a video interaction. Things like the way a person smells, the way that they move, the way that they smile, the way their teeth look when they smile, all kinds of small, small, subtle movements that have really strong effects, especially even if they only have small effects individually, that have strong effects collectively in person. And this is where this misattribution of arousal comes from. Uh, people thinking that they're going to like the person through their online interactions, not liking them in person. And a second potential cause of that misattribution of arousal 
might be just that the people are lonely and they're online and they're at home and they're stuck at home and they're desperate and that's the person that's there at the moment if they had more opportunities if they were interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis maybe they would be more discriminating in partner choice maybe they would have more options maybe they wouldn't uh, form these intense relationships almost through a kind of desperation so to speak with people who are still kind of strangers online and just a final note there was some research on attachment styles and the lockdowns and if you guys have heard of attachment styles, this is basically the idea that your relationship with your mother or your father your parents as a child determine the kind of relationships you have with uh, your romantic partners as an adult and there's empirical results to support this it sounds kind of Freudian and hokey personally to me I was always kind of skeptical but I got to admit guys there's research that does support it so you have secure attachment which describes about 50% of the population and then you have avoidant which is like 25% and anxious okay avoidant people don't want to get close anxious people want to be really close and they feel anxious when they can't be just summing it up very very crudely and so you can imagine that lockdowns where people can't meet the person they're interested in is going to have a pronounced effect upon people who have anxious attachment styles in particular it's going to stress them out more and that's kind of what the research shows is that lockdowns had more of an effect uh, as far as stress is concerned as far as reporting distress in relationships is concerned for people who had these anxious attachment styles and quickly for the last section I want to go over some mental health issues related to the lockdown that directly or indirectly impact uh, relationship quality and relationship outcomes some some of maybe the explanations for why the relationship outcomes have changed and also some expectations that we can have based on the effects on mental health that the lockdowns the pandemic and so on had on individuals so we see a general rise in mental health issues across the board for men and women related to the lockdowns specifically we see actually that this is reported more strongly for women women report greater uh, depression they report greater anxiety and women also reported a greater level of detachment of emotional detachment so kind of the opposite effect there that some people might expect where uh, instead of being close and desiring the closeness women may become more aloof less inclined to become emotionally close to other people at that point or even less inclined to be introspective about their own emotions so emotional detachment young people on average were affected much more by the lockdowns in these mental health metrics than the elderly were and that might be in part because young people are single at much much higher rates remember if we look at the relationship statistics for about the last 12 years from the GSS uh, between 50 and 60 percent of young people between 18 and 25 are single you start getting up to about 35 and above and it drops down to like 20 percent guys so people who have are locked down at home and they have a wife or a partner maybe they're going to be able to weather that lockdown even enjoy it more whereas if you're locked down at home and you're alone and you're single maybe that's contributing to some of the mental health issues specifically in young people basically isolation here we can look at another thing here related directly to relationships and mental health and this is the effect of the lockdowns on domestic violence okay domestic violence went up guys during the lockdowns and if you think about some of the things that predict domestic or I guess I should say things that make it even possible uh, the more time people spend together the more opportunities there are to fight the more opportunities there are to be violent to abuse your partner and so on so that's probably a big explanation of it is people that just don't have good relationships that are abusive being forced to spend a bunch of time together economic distress has always predicted higher rates of domestic violence both individually and at a population level so we're seeing also that economic distress caused by the lockdowns by the pandemic possibly exacerbating the domestic violence effect even more uh, so during economic downturns yeah that's what we see increase in domestic violence more potential because people are closer together and this is the case for men too as well guys it's not just women there's a male hotline called men's line they reported a 26 percent increase in men calling to report domestic violence during the pandemic so it, it you know domestic violence is typically in most of the research it's reported as women being victims more but it's not always the case we do see for example the same effect here for men this increase in domestic violence that does in fact go both ways and uh, 
uh, some, a silver lining at the very end here for mental health issues. Uh, and I kind of mentioned this before, but people who were in relationships uh, actually predicted, or I should say people that were in relationships reported higher relationship quality in some cases. They reported higher intimacy as well. So we kind of see an effect if we look at this compared to the domestic violence. People with good relationships that, that wanted to spend time together you know, maybe they had a, an opportunity to do that with the pandemic. Maybe this was the kind of thing that let them spend a lot of quality time together. They really love each other. They got to have more sex. They got to, so their intimacy went up. Their relationship quality went up. You know, they got to spend all the time they wanted with the person that they love. People that had bad relationships, well, then the pandemic compounded that as well. So it's kind of had a, a, a dual effect in that sense for people in relationships being forced to stay at home together. People that had good relationships, maybe it was good for them. People that had bad relationships, maybe it was bad for them. And anecdotally, I think you can see that in the way that people report their, their lockdown experiences. Some people really liked being able to work from home. They didn't want it to end. They did not want the lockdown to end. It was really cool for them. Maybe they're introverts also, and okay, that's just, they could live that way the rest of their lives. Other people, it was just a nightmare. Just cabin fever, they're alone. Maybe they're stuck with an abusive partner man or woman whatever it may be so situational effects here guys so quick summary and then I will sign out for today uh, probably the pandemic overall it's probably mostly bad for relationships for most people except for that cohort of people that sliver of people who entered into it and had good relationships perhaps they were able to weather it economically whatever for whatever reason they didn't feel all of the kind of stresses and pressures many other people did People who are in relationships, not single people. Casual sex throughout the pandemic. Is this good or bad, guys? I, I mean, I guess that depends on, on your goals and your perception of, of casual sex. Uh, there was more domestic violence, with both male and females reporting more victimization. So domestic violence, victimization went up for both sexes. There were a lot of associated mental health issues that would negatively affect relationships, uh, particularly for young people. So if you're a young person throughout the pandemic, especially if you're 18 or something, I'm sorry guys, I, it was really bad for you, probably worse than anyone else. And as far as app use specifically, we saw the app use increase, but we saw fewer meetings from the app. We saw different styles of app use, people using apps more to form online relationships, to chat and talk, less to actually meet people. So I hope that this was informative, guys. I hope you learned something. And I hope it answered some of the questions for the people that have asked specifically. I've had a lot of people ask me, how has the pandemic affected sex, relationships, dating apps specifically? Are people having more or less sex during the pandemic and so on? So maybe, maybe this is a start, probably not the full answer. None of these studies are ever gonna give the full answer, guys. But hopefully a start to let you know where to look, to look further into this research and to give you an idea, a general idea of what may be going on. So it was good to talk to you guys and I'll try to make another video for you.